So, well, hi everybody. My name is uh, Asad Ali Shaheed, and I am actually also uh, sometimes co-organizing the events with uh, Marco and Matteo with uh, for Machine Learning Milan. So today I'm going to talk about actually the reinforcement learning in the context of robotics. So just to begin with, I'll briefly give a small motivation. So you probably have seen like some impressive videos of robots doing some kind of agile acrobatic skills like this, like the one shown here in the video, which is really impressive because uh, just looking at these uh, systems performing some skills like that, it's really impressive. Like uh, it, it seems like the, we are really one step closer to the like the real robots which can uh, adopt their behavior. But if you look carefully, like uh, when these robot systems they are actually going into the realistic and more unpredictable settings where anything can happen so more like a real world setting so things like this happen so this is actually the video from approximately five years ago and uh, this is actually one of the famous uh, robotics challenge uh, called the harper robotics challenge so here we can see that when these robots they are actually operating in the real world they don't quite actually do the things that we generally see in the YouTube videos uh, they are doing. So it's a little bit disappointing that uh, uh, these robots, and the reason is actually because these robots, they don't actually learn the skills. In fact, they are many times programmed or they are highly tuned for whatever they are doing. So when in the real world, many situations arises which are unexpected and unpredictable, then they cannot quite adapt. On the other hand, Many times what we hear is like uh, computers beat uh, humans at something, all right? So for example, this is the picture of uh, a match from 1997. This was when the uh, computer beat the world's best player in the chess. And then there is this uh, pictures from recently from uh, when AlphaGo, the, the computer program designed by Google DeepMind, that beat the world's best player in Go, least at all. So here we can see both of the pictures or the pictures from these matches. So even though like in the first case in the chess match, there was not necessarily any kind of uh, artificial intelligence uh, involved. That's what the creator of uh, uh, the program that beat the human player in chess, they say. But the second program was actually, the Google DeepMind program was uh, actually uh, using reinforcement learning uh, to, to play the game against the world's best player. So we can notice here that, okay, even though it's very impressive, these games are really complex and they require like higher level reasoning skills, but we don't actually see the robots or the computers actually picking up the pieces. So in both cases, we see the humans which are representing the computer programs. Their job is twofold, to move the pieces. Uh, so actually in the case of uh, Google DeepMind, we see here this guy, his job is twofold. So to, to move the pieces in the computer, which can be seen here, uh, both of himself and on the board, he also has to move the pieces that are prescribed by the program. So this is something that goes under the name of Marwex paradox, which basically says that, uh, which uh, was formulated by some of the researchers in artificial intelligence and robotics community. Uh, so this guy named Hans Marwek, he said that it is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit added level performance on intelligent tests or playing checkers and difficult or even impossible to give them the skills of a one year old when it comes to perception and mobility. And it's actually quite true. So what we might think that the superhuman that we might think that, okay, that require high level reasoning skills, for example, playing a game of chess or playing a game of Go or solving some higher advanced level mathematical equations, they are relatively easy for the com easier for the computers. But in fact, when it comes to really displaying or exhibiting some kind of sensory motor skills, so basically somehow moving the hands or picking up stuffs, then the computers are still not good at there. So which is why we have machine learning algorithms which have beat the world's best player in the game of Go, but we still don't hear about the robots that can actually, that have even this simple skill of, for example, that can clean the dishes in the home. So in this talk, I will, uh, try to display a small uh, work that I have done in collaboration with ITSIA, uh, which is a Swiss AI lab in the south of uh, Switzerland in Lugano. So I will mainly focus on the three A main topics. So first of all, I will give a brief uh, introduction about the classical examples of reinforcement learning that has been around for quite some time. And then I'll 
briefly present some of the works in the modern reinforcement learning with function approximation. So which is also termed as deep reinforcement learning. So where the word deep actually refers only to the fact that there is a neural network somewhere in there. And then I will present the work that I was speaking about I have done uh, recently in collaboration with uh, ITSIA. All right, so I assume that not everybody in here is familiar with reinforcement learning. So I will just briefly describe what is actually reinforcement learning. So basically we have an agent and an, and an environment. So agent interacts with an environment. This is a problem of learning from interaction. So agent interacts with an environment in discrete time steps and receives some kind of representation of a state. So in response to that state, agent uh, decides something. So it, it makes a decision. So basically it uh, takes an action. It's also called an action in this reinforcement learning framework. And then the environment responds back with the consequence of that action. So for instance, the state of the environment will change and agent will also receive a reward, which will basically tell the agent how good or bad the action it took. So it's actually a very simple concept, uh, which is just based uh, on the idea that if you reward the right behavior and if you discourage the undesirable behavior, this kind of concept leads to behavioral change. So in fact, in the behavioral psychology, we have a lot of examples of uh, this kind of reinforcement learning. Uh, so the goal of the agent is actually to learn a policy. So policy, you can think about it, it's like a kind of uh, a factory that takes in some kind of state and outputs an action. So it can be stochastic or it can be deterministic. So for example, here I have denoted it with stochastic. So in case of stochastic policy, uh, it will output a probability distribution over actions uh, given a state. And when it's a deterministic policy, it will simply output a number or, or an action when it's given a state. So there is uh, no stochasticity in the environment. So in fact, this concept is actually quite similar to the way nature of learning happens in humans and animals. While it's not the only form of learning happening in the humans and animals, but we can argue that it's one of uh, the, the form of learning. Humans and animals, they tend to do the things that give them pleasure and they tend not to do the things that give them pain. So for instance, if we are teaching a dog uh, or if we are training a dog on something, so what might be the observation or, or state? So observation one might include, for example, the sensory signals of, uh, of a dog. So in this case, it could be sight, smell, touch here. And what could be the actions? So the actions might correspond to it. In, it, it in fact, it's the same for action for most of the animals. So basically to move the muscles to respond to certain situations. And then the reward could be simply the food, for example, this uh, dog gets. On the other hand, if we have a robot that we want to train with reinforcement learning on some task, the observation or state might include, for example, the camera images from the robot or the position of its joints or or for instance, if the, the task of the robot is to basically pick up something, then it might also include the, the position of the object or the position of the part that the robot has to actually pick up. And then the action might include, for example, the, the torques that the robot has to apply to its uh, joints, or it also might include, for example, velocities, and it can take a lot of different forms. And the reward in this case is simply a measure of uh, task success. Uh, so which means that if uh, the task is task for this humanoid robot is to run, maybe the reward would be proportional to the running speed. So basically how, how fast the robot runs, the more reward it gets. So just to make it a little bit concrete, I have uh, given some of the examples. Okay, so what's quite impressive is reinforcement learning is actually not new. So even though nowadays it's a, a bit of a hype as well, and we see a lot of works happening in the area, but actually reinforcement learning is not new. So here you see two works that are, so the, both of these videos, they are actually more than two, like 10 years old. So in one case, in the, in the left case, you see that the robot is actually uh, learning to flip a pancake by using reinforcement learning. And in the second case, you see that the robot is learning a game of uh, the kids game of a ball in a cup task. And in both of the cases, what was uh, quite evident is that the human comes and demonstrates the behavior and then the robot basically learns through trial and error by interacting with an environment. Uh, but what's interesting here is that, so it takes a, approximately 50 trials in one case and the 100 trials in the other case to learn a task. But the, the, 
the works that were presented earlier in the reinforcement learning, they, they implied some kind of very hand-designed representation. Uh, so, in fact, it involved a lot of manual engineering. So basically, there was some kind of controller that was controlling this robot, and then that kind of controller exposed some small number of parameters that would be actually learned by a reinforcement learning algorithm. Just because it was very difficult to apply reinforcement learning algorithms in high dimensional spaces. So basically, it was not possible to learn like more than 100 parameters, so which is why it involved a lot of hand engineering and hand designing the policy representations. But recently, we have seen like the success of deep learning or neural networks, uh, mostly in the supervised settings. So for example, here, uh, deep learning actually is a technology that helps us handle the unstructured environments. So we have a giant neural network. Uh, it can be a convolutional neural network in case of image classification or some other type of neural network for some other tasks. So when we train this kind of neural network or large data set, so for instance, lots of images very diverse from downloaded from ImageNet uh, uh, data, then it has actually shown quite a nice success. So this kind of network can actually generalize to unseen scenarios. So, and it's able to deal with the uh, natural input. So for example, like an image, in fact, it has shown success in the computer vision tasks, speech translations, and some, some other, uh, some other uh, application domains as well. But we cannot actually directly apply them in the domain of uh, robotics. Because the problem with the robots is like, if there is an image uh, that is uh, attached to the robot and the robot is seeing some kind of image of the world and it has to do something, nobody can actually tell that, uh, okay, here is the image that the robot is seeing and here is an action that the robot, here is a label or here is an action that the robot has to perform. So because we don't have any kind of data sets like this. So we have data sets, for example, for many other supervised learning problems like ImageNet, but here we don't have. So in fact, it's really a tedious task. So where do we obtain the data sets and who will actually label them? So which is why actually in the robotics domain, reinforcement learning provides us such kind of uh, framework for, so we have high capacity function approximators that can represent basically any kind of function. On the other hand, we have reinforcement learning algorithms that gives us a framework to, for decision making actually. So how to make a sequence of decisions, that's what the reinforcement learning algorithms uh, actually do. So it turns out if we combine these two kind of things, it's a very powerful mechanism. And so the term deep reinforcement learning, it's not so old. So we can, one can argue that it's a relatively new term, maybe like a few years old. Uh, and it simply means that when you combine neural networks with uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, but it's not so simple because uh, there is a lot of problems that arise because uh, in case of uh, supervised learning problems, we have a fixed data set. So once we download the data set, we train for many epochs and we observe the performance. But in case of reinforcement learning, the data set is actually changing all the time. So whenever the agent is going to take an action, the data set will actually, the distribution of the data will change. So there is a lot of problems here, but still, Recently, we have seen some kind of success stories of deep reinforcement learning, mostly in the games. So in particular, the work here uh, by uh, on the Atari games, it uh, showed quite a nice performance. So basically it just received an input like an image, what a human will see on the screen and the agent learned to perform the action. So the ag actions were quite simple. Basically the agent had to move simply in the first case, up or down the cart or in the second case, left or right. And then they showed that actually you can achieve a human level performance in playing these games if you train it for, uh, for a reasonable amount of time. On the other side, maybe this example is much more familiar. Uh, AlphaGo, like I mentioned previously, the program that used reinforcement learning and uh, Monte Carlo 3 search uh, in order to beat the world's best player in the game of Go which is actually a very complex game. So if you try to think about it, uh, it's a lot of states in this game, first of all. And, uh, but still, uh, somehow it, it managed to beat the human player in the game of Go. But if you look at the reinforcement learning applications in the robotics, the problem is that 
both of these cases, they learned actually with a very high amount of experience, which is not feasible in the domain of robotics. So we cannot have a robot learn uh, for a simple task like picking up something for maybe two months. It's uh, just not feasible. Moreover, it's a physical system. So maybe if the agent takes an action, that action might not be very phys feasible, feasible in the real world. So there are safety issues, there are a lot of concerns. So it's really actually a physical system uh, which has to operate in the physical world. On the other hand, there is a presence of continuous state and action spaces in robotics. So it's actually real numbers. So there is nothing like the robot has to uh, move in a certain place in the grid. It's really about the robot has to move, take a, a continuous real number uh, actions. So this further complicates the application of reinforcement learning in the robotics. And moreover, what is actually the reward? So in this case, in both these cases, we can see that the robot was simply when at the end, it was a scalar value one or two when the agent won the game. So in fact, in the first case here, it can be seen on the top of the screen that, so the agent can see it and the job of the agent is actually to maximize this number as much as possible. So it's relatively simple than what happened in the real world. So in the real world, if you want to train the reinforcement learning on a real robot, we might have to somehow observe what is the re reward. And we might have to provide some instrumentation in the environment, some kind of sensors that observe how well the robot is doing on a task. So it's really uh, these kind of issues, they further complicates the applicability of reinforcement learning for robotics. But indeed, still, we have seen in the recent years some success of uh, modern deep reinforcement learning. Uh, for robots. So here uh, we can see actually three, some of the famous works. So in the first case, uh, they actually describe more or less how the current reinforcement learning is applied in the domain of uh, robotics uh, in the recent years. In the first work, they actually learn directly into the real world, but they combine the techniques from optimal, optimal control and also a lot of engineering actually. So they combine neural networks with reinforcement learning algorithms, but they instead in order to limit the experience that is required for the traditional reinforcement learning algorithms, they use, uh, they, what they do is they learn the dynamic models. Uh, because if you learn the dynamic models, then you can obtain the policy from it. But the problem in this uh, work is it works on a simple task. So in other words, the tasks that are quite smooth in dynamics and without any uh, discontinuities. So for example, if the robot has to actually uh, pick up the pick up something so we can imagine it has to go close to the thing and close its gripper so that's a very big uh, discontinuity there and the dynamics is not smooth there so this approach will not work there so it will learn a very bad dynamics model so in fact in the end the robot will do something really crazy whereas in the second picture here you can see that they tackle the problem of uh, data collection with multiple robots collecting data for like two, three months uh, continuously. And they also constrain the workspace of the robot. So by looking at these robotic arms, uh, one might uh, infer that these robots, um, they could actually move uh, anywhere uh, within the workspace of uh, their boundaries. But instead, they just uh, constrain the workspace just only in front of uh, these baskets that you can see. So these baskets are full of a lot of objects and the robots collect for two, three months the data and they have to pick up the objects just by trying. But it requires a lot of resources, so not everybody can really avail it. And this third work is uh, more kind of recent work last year. Uh, where the robot uh, hand was trained in the simulation uh, to how to manipulate the cube, uh, the Rubik's cube. So it's actually a very difficult control problem if you think from the controls perspective, because uh, so the degrees of freedom that this hand has, it's close to 24, I guess. So, which means it's a lot of different ways that the robot can actually move its, uh, take an action. So which is why they tackle the problem of, uh, uh, experience in the simulation so they in fact then they use something uh, which is innovative it's uh, called domain randomization in order to transfer from simulation to reality uh, so which simply means so even though it's a very sophisticated word domain randomization but it means that you train so many different versions of a task in the simulation that the real world just looks like any other simulation 
So for example, you would change the size of the cube, you would change the friction on the robot hand, maybe you would change the color, lighting conditions, and a lot of different things. Because in this case, they were also using the camera images uh, in order to estimate the state of the, of the robot, of the system. All right, so then now third point, what I have done recently, uh, the work on the deep reinforcement learning. So in fact, the task that we have analyzed, it's uh, quite uh, a basic task, but it happens quite often in the industrial setting. So it's a task of basically grasping a cube, uh, not actually a cube, but we analyze the system on the cube. So the job of the robot is actually to learn a control policy that can grasp and lift the cube that is placed somewhere on the table. So in this case, the control policy that we learn is from a simulated experience and we don't learn any kind of uh, system dynamics or the model of the system. So in other words, we just uh, use model free reinforcement learning algorithms to learn this task. And then we transfer the learned behavior directly to real robot without any kind of domain randomization. So the recipe here is that we don't use any image data. Uh, we use like the information that is directly available and easily available and it doesn't require a lot of compute power because all the other works that I have mentioned before mostly they require enormous compute power so it's not like you can train them on a single laptop with one GPU for example and then interesting th thing that we do is in order to tackle the sample efficiency so a large experience we use a concept of transfer learning which is quite prevalent in the other applications of neural network so simply transferring the pre-trained networks uh, weights of the network from one task we actually find out that it's possible to learn a partially new task in the new settings uh, with much less experience so the framework consists of uh, Again, two main components. We have an agent and an environment. So agent is actually where the reinforcement learning algorithms are. So we use two different algorithms. Uh, they are quite modern, proximal policy optimization and soft effect critic. So here I will present only the results from the first one, uh, which is a non-policy algorithm, proximal policy optimization. But for the second one, the approach is more or less the same. same. So in the environment, we have here the digital replica of a robot that is interacting with the hair. You can see the cube that is placed on the table and it has to approach the cube. It has to grasp its fingers and uh, it has to lift it. And the workspace of the robot is not constrained in any way. So basically it's a robot that is in the real settings. It's exactly the same. We don't constrain anything in this robot. So all the things that is available in the real settings, it's exactly the same in the, in the simulation. And then in the environment, we also have a controller that receives the action from the agent and then it executes on to the, to the robot. And the, in the algorithm side, we have a replay buffer that stores the experience data, uh, for example, state sections and rewards tuples. And then it performs like a policy improvement phase where the optimization objective of uh, one of these algorithms is used to update the weights in the neural network. So in fact, the policy is represented by a neural network in this setting. And then in the policy evaluation phase, we have another neural network that is uh, uh, estimating the corresponding value of a state uh, to guide the policy learning in the policy improvement phase. So policy considered here is a stochastic. So it's a conditional probability distribution over action given a state. And Yes, the actions from the robot, they consist of joint sections. So we have uh, the robot here, the robot has seven joints. So the dimension of joints is seven and then the gripper action, which is basically the two fingers of the robot. Uh, and it's a, a mirror. So the dimensionality of the gripper action is one. So here, if you look at uh, more, what are the states and the actions? Both are continuous, like in the real setting. Uh, so they are all continuous numbers. So in case of state, there are two main uh, input modalities. So first one is robot proprioception information. So proprioception essentially means like uh, some people say that it's a sixth sense of humans. So it means that having a knowledge of, of where your arms or where your body parts actually are in the world. So that's why I wrote it here, proprioception. In fact, it's uh, exactly the same in kind of information. So the position of the joints of the robot, velocities of uh, the robot joints, 
and then the gripper position and then the end factor so basically the position of the hand and how the hand is oriented and then we have the velocity linear and angular velocity components of the hand and then in case of object centric state we simply provide the robot uh, agent with the uh, where the part in this case the cube is in the world reference frame and how this cube is oriented and how far the robot is from the cube so these are the three pieces of information which are provided so the total dimensionality of the state is uh, 46 in the actions like i mentioned before it's state dimensional corresponding to the joint's velocities for seven degrees of freedom of the arm robot arm and then the for, uh, the one dig uh, one uh, dimension for for the fingers because it's a mirror so left and right uh, fingers they either open or they close but they open or close in the continuous manner so exactly like they are uh, operating on a real robot so then uh, the actions are uh, are interpreted as desired joint velocities and then they go into the controller so here in the second to last equation you can see that that converts them into the learned torques by applying this uh, fixed proportional gains then they are executed into the into the environment so like i said reward is one of the most important components uh, maybe not not so much important in the games because there is a sparse reward there but here it's not possible generally to train with the sparse rewards in fact it's very very difficult so we provide a dense reward here in this case so in this case for example the task is divided into two phases so first phase is a reaching phase the robot has to just only approach the part and then the second phase is a grasping and lifting phase they are both combined together in the same phase and for the reaching phase here the reward is quite simple it's composed of three main contributions so distance reward velocity reward and gripper reward they are all weighted by their respective weights uh, so uh, by the way this reward is designed after several iterations uh, of observing the behavior so distance reward is simply how far is the, the robot scraper from the cube and then the velocity reward we included it because we don't want the robot hand to approach the cube with the high velocity and then in that case it will change the original position of the cube where it was located it's quite important in the industrial settings uh, not to do that and then the gripper reward simply rewards the robot agent if the robot approach the cube with the open gripper so it's uh, all the scalar values for the case of grasping and lifting it's similar we have five contributions where the distance velocity and the gripper uh, distance and velocity is the same as in the previous case but now gripper reward is uh, for the closing of the gripper so in fact we switch on to this second phase when the robot is uh, in the more or less the grip, grip site is in the boundary of the of the cube so then we have two additional components of grasp and success so grasping reward is a scalar value again if both of the fingers of the robot they are in touch with the cube we can see it quite easily in the simulation in fact in the real world also it's not so difficult uh, so and then the success reward simply rewards the robot if the robot has performed the task successfully which means it's holding the cube above uh, a certain height uh, above the table so then here we can see actually the learning in the action and so at the beginning when the networks are initialized randomly we can see that the robot is actually taking actions all over the place randomly and then just after a million steps of training we can see here that there is a monotonic improvement in the in the reward the reward that was designed before and the robot is learning to approach the cube in fact after three million steps it's already somehow learning that it has to grasp the cube and uh, so in fact after training for four million steps on a simple hardware uh, laptop with one gpu so we can see that it has actually succeeded in the task but the task success is only for few steps so which is why we train it for 10 million steps in order to achieve the success rate for more time steps in an episode so episode lasts for approximately 600 steps which corresponds to around two and a half seconds of uh, of real time so the robot has two and a half seconds to actually pick up the to move to the cube and then grasp it and then lift it off the table so after learning the policy the control policy for 10 million steps 
we do two different, uh, we evaluate two different scenarios by performing 10 evaluation trials and understanding if the task is successfully performed or not. So in the first case, which is the top table here, you can see that uh, the part position is the fixed. So nominal cube means that the, row, the cube that uh, was used during training phase, it's, uh, it has dimensions of approximately six centimeters. And then the smaller cube is approximately half the size, whereas cylinder is like a different shape. And then the screwdriver, which is also shown here in the video, uh, it's a totally different geometry. So in fact, the behavior is easily uh, generalizable to the different shapes as it can be seen here. And then the success rate of 100% is uh, reported here by evaluating 10 different trials. Whereas here in the second case, the lower table, what we do is we change the position of the part, the original position where it was placed. So in the first case, sorry, in the first case, we change the position of the robot. So the initial starting position of the robot. So we inject some random noise in here and still we can see that the robot succeeds around eight out of 10 test trials. And whereas in the second case, we either modify the position of the uh, part in the plus direction or the minus direction and still the robot was successfully able to lift the, ta uh, the cube and complete the task seven out of 10 times. And in the last case, the position was modified by a big amount. And then what we did was we used the pre-trained weights from the previous uh, task model and we retrained it uh, in order to learn with the new position and we wanted to see if it learns faster. So in fact, in the 30 minutes of uh, retraining, it is able to again successfully complete the task. So in this case, we additionally apply the concept of transfer learning simply by transferring the, reusing the, uh, the, the weights and transferring them into the new task settings. But also on the other side, we modify the task partially. So three different scenarios we have considered. In the first case, uh, robot redundancy management, it means that uh, the robot has to manage uh, basically the, 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 the possibility of uh, actions it has available. So for instance, it, it's not so good in the real settings that the robot is taking actions close to the joint limits. Uh, because it's not so safe. So which is why we include some penalty to penalize this kind of behavior that leads to the learning agent taking actions that puts the robot uh, close to the joint limits, any of the joint, uh, any of the seven joints. In the second case, we want to minimize the jerky behavior. So the robot has to minimize the change in the velocities of its joints. And in the last case, we modify the scene with some obstacles. And the task is to, again, lift the cube, grasp and lift the cube, but uh, avoid the collisions with uh, obstacles that are present in the scene. And these uh, performance objectives, they are included uh, successively, so one by one. Uh, and the behavior is retrained starting from the previous configuration. So in fact, here in, for the first case, we can see for the baseline task model, the robot was taking action around 34% of the time, close to the limits, uh, joint limits. And after training for around 30 minutes, it learns to adapt its behavior and not to take the actions close to the limits, which is uh, quite evident in the video as well. And then for the second case here, we can see that these are the learned talks, which are directly applied to the simulation environment for all seven joints of the robot. They are plotted here and blue is the curve where the acceleration penalty is included to minimize the jerky behavior. So in fact, we can see here the learn talks are much more smoother for the blue curve than they are for the baseline scenario where the no acceleration penalty was uh, included. And this is also the result of 30 minutes of uh, training. And then this is the last case. So here you can see that there are two obstacles. So it actually gives very small room for the robot hand to position itself uh, around the cube before lifting it. So if it even touches one of the cube, the penalty is given. So here in the video, you can see the first, uh, the baseline model was actually colliding with the cube, lifting the, uh, sorry, lifting the cube, but colliding with the cylindrical obstacle. But here we retrain the, uh, the, the behavior for one hour 
and you can see here it actually learns quite quickly to navigate the obstacles and uh, lift, uh, lift the cube. So finally, we transfer the behavior on the real robot. So like I said, we don't include any image data. So there is not like a real need for domain randomization, which is mainly required if you want to transfer because the simulation camera can never really replicate the, the reality. But in fact, the, the real physical situations for the robot joints are more or less the same as in the, as in the simulation. Of course, there are some other additional effects like uh, maybe the cube is not placed exactly in the same location or maybe of course there is a friction in the robot joints, but those effects are considered in the simulation also. So here what we do is we resample the positions of the robot joints from the simulation uh, from 500 hertz to 1000 hertz. This is because the simulation was being performed at 500 hertz. So there was uh, every every two milliseconds there was a simulation uh, state was changing, and the real robot is operating at 1000 hertz control frequency. So which is why we resample is. And here in the video you can see that just by simply uh, transferring the positions it is able to, and without any fine tuning, it is able to do the task in the real settings. Uh, so, which was actually quite uh, uh, impressive for us. All right, so that's it for my talk and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take your questions.